Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to Slick Talk, and I am your host, Blackstone Joe. Today's episode is brought to you by... Well, all right, hold on. Slow down. I have to remind myself we don't have any official sponsors. That's okay. So I'll tell you what. In lieu of official sponsorships, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to things I like and I'm currently enjoying. Today's shout out goes to Old Crown Coffee. They're a family owned and operated coffee roaster here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Yes, in the Summit City, we have no shortage of great coffee options in addition to schools, churches, gentlemen's clubs. I digress. Fort Wayne's known for a lot of things, but fortunately, coffee is one of them. And Old Crown's doors have been open since 1999. Their house blend keeps me coming back. And there's just a few things in this world I'm a snob about, okay? That's coffee, bourbon, James Bond films. Not necessarily in that order, but rest assured, if I give a shout out to a particular kind of coffee, it's not simply because I'm a casual. I need it. It's the lifeblood. It's in the cup every morning. So if you are heading to Fort Wayne, if you're a local resident who just happens to not know about Old Crown for some godforsaken reason, get yourself over to their location on Anthony and have yourself a cup of house. Now, this episode has a new segment going to become reoccurring, okay? This is Tales from the Rig. This will be a segment where I tell fables involving my beloved Chevy Silverado and the adventures we get up to. So here's the situation. The inaugural Tale from the Rig. The other day, I'm with my wife and we're taking a trip down 33 to Elkhart, Indiana. Now from Fort Wayne, it's about an hour and 40 minutes, so it's not a huge odyssey under any circumstances still it's pitch black it's snowing and i'm making the trip with an entertainment center loosely strapped to the rig so to say i'm white knuckling it would be fair no 33 is not like driving through chicago or atlanta or la But it wasn't exactly taking a vacation under the current circumstances, and boy, did I wish I had a cup of Old Crown by my side. (laughs) Anyway, all's well that ends well. We made it back to Fort Wayne with the Entertainment Center, which will go in the house we're moving into in just a few days. And luckily, I had the rig by my side, trusty V8 and all, and I'm sure it won't be the last time I'll be thankful for having this truck by my side. And no, this isn't a Chevy ad. Don't get it twisted. I don't want the comments to be blown up with Blackstone Joe is throwing a cape on for Chevy. I love my Silverado. It's important to me for many reasons. But here's the deal. I'm also susceptible to the word new in advertising. I, I'm, I know some of you are too. So I might be driving something else. It's okay. It's all right to have a diversified palette. And truth be told, you know, my ownership history of vehicles has been nothing short diverse so far. But for this segment, Tales from the Rig, yes, I was happy to have that Silverado. And by the way, if you opt for the double cab version, not the crew cab, I mean, okay, I might have to opt for the crew cab at a later point in my life, but the double cab with the six foot bed, boy, it's a lifesaver, especially when you're moving. And that wraps up the first tale from the rig. Now on to the main event. It's time to break down some data from 6.0 and 7.3 liter power stroke diesels. You know, last time we asked for questions for the Q&A with the analyst, some folks were asking about these engines and they've come up before that too. So I want to break into the topic with a special episode rather than just a quick one-off Q&A segment answer, you know. We see thousands and thousands of samples from both of these models for good reason. They have a good reputation. So let's just go a little bit back in time to when we first were introduced 
to the 7.3 liter power stroke. So this engine replaced the 7.3 liter IDI, and that was a major shift in how we expected these engines to wear. So before that, we generally found a lot of metal, particularly iron, in some of these diesel engine models. But the 7.3 liter power stroke proved that you could generate a lot of power, and that didn't have to go hand in hand with a lot of metal. So let's take a step back here. Why does metal content matter? Well, engines that don't make a lot of metal, they tend to be great candidates for, amongst other things, extended oil use. These engines are also notable for not having results that take us by surprise. So we have averages, right? And these are specific to the engine type. I'm, I'm referring to universal averages. If you look at one of our reports, they're on the far right column, and they give you a baseline for comparison. Now, importantly, with universal averages, we don't include samples that have absurd results, really abnormal levels of metal, contamination, issues that would throw off a baseline comparison because when you include samples with very zany results where we just know that, you know, there, there's no good reason for there to be, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of PPM of metal. We want to use a baseline for comparison where engines are producing wear levels close to what we expect from past trends, from data that we've stored up over time. So we're, we're not going to be comparing to an engine that, you know, has a, has a severe coolant leak that has some bizarre amount of, let's say, silicon from the sampling technique. We're going to try and keep the absurd samples in the absurd stack, so to speak, um, and, and then keep samples with wear levels that are that are reasonable with with uh, no issues with contamination, you know, the amounts that can really thwart how an engine wears. So for the 7.3, only 3.1%, yes, we dug into the numbers, we got that nitty gritty, only 3.1% of these samples from 7.3s were excluded from averages thus far, either by virtue of them having an obvious problem or some other abnormal result that we wouldn't necessarily want in averages because it would skew the results quite a bit. Now let's shift gears to the 6.0 liter power stroke. Now this engine had an interesting start in just how much fuel dilution showed up virtually every sample when these engines were new. They almost all had injector issues out of the factory, but once those issues were ironed out, this engine really turned out to be a great one. Now, much like the 7.3 liter power stroke, we don't often have results that take us by surprise. Just 5.4% of 6.0 liter power stroke samples are not included in averages. So with that, it's easy to tell these engines tend to wear consistently and we don't often find problems with contamination. Now, a little unlike the 7.3 and not in a bad way, a seasoned analyst can pretty much spot a 6.0 liter power stroke sample coming from a mile away. The first reason is a low viscosity. Now, a seasoned analyst can pretty much spot a 6.0 liter power stroke sample coming from a mile away. And one reason is they have a consistently low viscosity. How consistently? Well, roughly 73% of 6.0 liter samples that we've tested have a low viscosity, and only 20%, roughly, of the time does that coincide with excess fuel. 
So take it from my seat. I see it's a diesel engine. You know, when I first pull up the sample, I'm just looking at customer information. I'm making sure we have everything uh, dialed in right. We have the right sample details, all that clerical information. And then I'm looking at the numbers. I'm just digesting what I have in front of me. So first thing I see is that it's a diesel engine oil. You know, by virtue of the presence of soot, the, the way the additive elements look, you know, diesel engine oil has a pretty signature uh, characteristic in terms of the additives usually. It's easy to spot. And then you have the presence of soot, then you have this low viscosity. Usually it's not related to fuel. And then you might also have the presence of an additive like Arch Oil or Revex. Now, a quick word on Arch Oil and Revex. So these are harmless additives. They just happen to be pretty popular in the 6.0 crowd. Um, not so much, I would say, in the 7.3. Um, you know, you'll see it, but not terribly often. So why do these additives matter? So they're additives that are in addition to what you get in the oil to start off with. And that's kind of a point I want to drive home to just because it tends to be an area of confusion. So oil has additive elements, you know, unless you're running some like mineral product, you know, like a mineral oil in an aircraft, it will have additive ingredients. So when we ask on the slip, on every slip we send out, on the back of it, we ask, have you used any additives? We're talking about the stuff that's in addition to what's in the engine oil to begin with. So Arch Oil, Revex, two of the more common ones with the diesel engine crowd, especially 6.0 owners, these additives matter because they contain a lot of potassium, a lot of boron. You'll also see a smaller amount of sodium. If you've listened to our coolant episode, just a brief digression here, coolant shows up as potassium and sodium. So if you don't mention additives and we see a lot of these elements, either potassium or sodium, well, likely explanation is coolant. But so often I'm just looking at a 6.0 liter sample and I see a lot of potassium, a boron level that's really similar. And you combine that with every other characteristic I've mentioned so far, and it's pretty obvious that I'm looking at a sample from a 6.0. And it kind of speaks to, you know, I remember when I was a newer analyst, um, one way to look at samples is just taking in all the high levels and first asking yourself, you know, are any of these problematic? What might be going on that's not a problem? And there's just an engine that couldn't be more true of with a 6.0 where you need to take a second and judge these highlights. And you'll quickly find that there's usually a high level here, a low viscosity there, that none of it's problematic. You know, uh, Arch Oil and Revex, harmless additives. The viscosity, low, sure, but is it due to fuel? Usually not. And if it's not related to fuel dilution, a slightly low viscosity isn't problematic. So that's also something I want to speak to. These engines, they normally shear the oil, specifically talking about the 6.0 here, not the 7.3. But folks often hear the word shear or just, you know, low viscosity and think, oh, well, that's something I should address. That's something I should fix. It's just not the case because, again, think earlier I talked about how few of these samples we exclude from averages. Well, for excluding very, very few, then that also means that metals are generally in great shape. I mean, again, we're talking just around 5% of samples not going in averages. So clearly, metals are usually in good shape. We're usually not finding a lot of contamination. So take that low viscosity and really consider it a minor point, a minor blemish. Because also keep in mind, we're not merely going to see a low viscosity and say, it's fine every time. If we ever see one that's unusually low, 
or we see something where it might be related to engine wear, we will take that into account. So what I'm saying is low viscosity, very common. While it's harmless with no other indication of trouble, that doesn't mean that we aren't making that conclusion carefully. We will look at metals. We will see if the viscosity is low, but is it unusually low for a 6.0? So we're not just making these blind calls. We truly are taking the whole report into account. And at the end of the day, the 6.0, the 7.3, two well-wearing engines, they're usually great fits for extended oil use. And they just don't take us by surprise a whole lot. And that's probably the best compliment I can give an engine. I look at the sample details and I see that you sent us a 7.3, a 6.0 sample. Usually I know it's going to be an easy report. I know I'm not going to be looking at a lot of problems, abnormal balance of metals. It's going to be a consistent shape of metals. And that's something that, you know, I remember coming on learning how to look at data one of the analysts who was here before me talked about the shape of metals and we're speaking to how these metals are balanced against each other and with both of these engines we're talking about we just have a good feel for what that typically looks like and when i'm pulling up a sample i see that healthy shape of metals i see an absence of contamination and sure, you might have a blemish here or there, low viscosity, what have you. But it's just a rare day that I look at one of these samples and I don't know what's going on or I see something where it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This engine, something isn't right. It's a rare day and that's what makes them two engines that not only have a good reputation out on the road, they have a good reputation amongst us, behind the computers, behind the data, trying to find out what the narrative is. It's usually a good one. So that wraps up our talk on 6.0s and 7.3s. If you like what you heard, don't forget to rate and review the show, as well as give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And as always, thanks for listening. This is Blackstone Joe, signing off. <laughs>